Uh, yeah, I, I see this uh, very much as a, uh, a kind of a, a, a something of a rounding up of the day, a bit of reflection on the day, and a chance to move um, into a conversation um, rather than a, a formal paper. Um, the latter being um, somewhat hampered by two factors. One of which is this is literally my last day of uh, research fellowship when I'm thinking about something completely different, um, and therefore <laughs> kind of uh, thinking uh, thinking about illustration at this point was was a bit difficult. But also, more critically, um, uh, we we can't uh, at this moment show slides in this room, which for an art historian, see, I see, I think it's a plot, <laughs> but you book people, you book people to kind of uh, disable uh, poor art historian uh, who only has the pictures. Um, uh, so, so what I want to do is, is um, uh, talk around, or sort of point towards what we might perceive as um, gaps, um, misapprehensions, and questions of scale and of authority um, in at least two regards. Um, one of which is the gaps, misapprehensions, and questions of scale and authority between text and images, which is kind of most obviously you know, what we've been addressing today. Uh, but also the gaps, the misapprehensions, the questions of scale and authority that exist between disciplines as well. So there's some kind of ele element of reflexiveness, which I think we might um, kind of introduce at the end of today, because we are literary historians, we are um, art historians, we are cultural historians, we are theatrical historians, we kind of sit between um, um, those poles. Um, so I want to, yes, yeah, so, so I want to kind of point towards some of those, what some of those gaps and mis misapprehensions might be. Um, I want to kind of point towards what role a practical perspective might bring, uh, what role a practical perspective might, might play. And I do so from the perspective of a, a, an art historian, but also a curator and somebody who works in a museum. Um, and I mentioned right at the beginning of the day that, that those kind of quite you know, real, practical questions when it comes to presenting works which have an illustrative function or has an illustrative role, um, when you put them into a museum context, when you publish them, um, well, how do you uh, recapture their context? How do you recapture their meanings? How do you actually uh, relay or make available uh, the literary uh, context and associations that those works have? So those are kind of practical things. Um, and then thirdly, something which has kind of occurred to me at various points today, there's this question of um, evidence as well. Um, what evidence do we mobilise in supporting or, or challenging the readings that we make of these uh, um, uh, uh, illustrative works? Um, uh, now, I gave a kind of a title when I was cornered and said you need a title for your paper. I gave the title of uh, uh, Blake and the, and the Limits of Illustration um, uh, because I think you can make the case that, that Blake has, a, has a, a privileged role to play or Blake may be privileged as a figure um, in thinking about those various questions. Uh, firstly, because he is unusually intensively scrutinised. You know, we know that kind of the classic uh, shopping list, laundry list question really comes into play. Uh, uh, all of you will be familiar with the literature around Blake. We kind of know what he had for his dinner on a certain day. And, you know, there's lots of things that we don't know, but we probably do know what he, what he had for dinner on a Thursday and whatever. You know, there's that kind of intense scrutiny, and that is illuminating in itself. Um, uh, but also because Blake, uh, 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 and there are a number of you know, very distinguished Blakean scholars here, uh, presents special problems in thinking about the issue of illustration because of his combination of being a poet uh, 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 and a maker of images, because of his uh, 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 distinctive uh, role as a, as a, as a, as a printmaker, um, uh, because of the uh, uh, arcane and challenging symbolism which is um, um, uh, manifested. Although... Um, a lot of what we think of as being special about Blake, or distinct or unique to him, we are finding out more and more, um, um, is not quite so unique, not quite so special, and may actually have a, a more general relevance. So Blake, I think, is interesting um, to think about a little bit because he is both um, um, scrutinised and may seem unique and unusual, but also um, a lot of what seems unique and unusual may actually be more um, of his time than we would allow. So... Uh, to do this, and I say, I'm, this, is, this is a sketch, which I, and, I, and I want to kind of move into um, um, this conversation quite swiftly. Um, I'm going to firstly offer a fable, um, not about Blake, but about Briggs, because I can and I want to. <laughs> um, and then secondly, um, think about three sets of questions, which I think may now, I'll try to extend to four in light of what we've been hearing today. Um, and the questions being about sequences rather than stories, and about narrativity. Um, one. Um, two, I've got to make sure I've got my fingers. Uh, two, um, 
the question of the pre-existing text or the lack thereof, right? whether illustrations about an image following a text. Um, thirdly, uh, about how we read gallery spaces, those historical gallery spaces that we've been looking at today. And then fourthly, and most timidly, um, about theatre. Um, and something which I've been hearing very clearly today in another context as well, about how, certainly for art historians uh, and for literary historians as well, we need to think about theatre um, much more than perhaps we, we, we traditionally have done. So, um, without a slide, but rather, well, I guess I've had an OHP or something maybe, but I've got a, um, not enough, but do send these around. It's an engraving which you may possibly know, some of you actually. Uh, I'll send a couple over here. Um, you may know it. Um, it's an engraving uh, entitled Bertha, which appeared in the Keepsake for 1834, published Christmas 1833, um, to accompany a, uh, uh, the tale of uh, The Mortal Immortal by Mary Shelley, uh, billed as the author of Frankenstein, as she usually would be at that point. Um, so it's an image which is certainly familiar to uh, Shelley um, scholars and to scholars of the literary annuals. Um, the uh, image is identified as, say, as Berta. Uh, I forget the engraver, but the uh, painter is identified not in the illustration I've given there, but in the original print in the bottom left-hand corner is H.P. Briggs, um, pinks it, so it kind of refers to uh, a pre-existing painting. Um, and as an illustration of the mortal immortal, it has elicited a certain amount of uh, uh, a very kind of thoughtful um, commentary uh, in recent uh, literature, uh, including a quite an intensive kind of scrutinisation um, of this uh, uh, print uh, by um, I've got probably a uh, mis mispronounced name, Sonia Hofkosch. Maybe somebody knows her, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which has all sorts of interesting things to say about literary annuals and their, the role that literary annuals have um, in the kind of cultural economy of the 1830s, 1840s. So, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a valuable piece. She has something quite specific in, in, in reading this image. Um, the engraving, those of you who have sight of it, you can sort of, you know, listen to this as you... The engraving depicts the moment Bertha crosses her imperious patroness to marry her humble lover, renouncing the detested luxuries of aristocracy for the real happiness of an alternative economy. As Winsey, who's the protagonist of the story, puts it, I am honest if I am poor. Here, aristocracy stands revealed as an artificial paradise in the person of the elaborately draped, shaded figure of the old high-born hag, whose walking stick held in front of her as a sign of her masculinized authority, foregrounds the picture, centering the opposition between the bloated and shadowed figure and the clear light form of the beautiful Bertha, the walking stick both blocks Bertha's path and visually reinforces the true contours of her body, outlined through the folds of her dress as she gracefully moves down the stair. The engraving highlights the opposition in order to reveal Bertha's beauty in its true feminine form and indeed as the feminine form of the honest truth itself. So this is a kind of very interesting, you know, closely attentive um, reading of the image. Now, where a question arises is, um, is this actually Bertha? <laughs> because, as I say, in the bottom left-hand corner, it says Henry uh, H.P. Briggs pinks it, and it's not hard to find out, probably easier than it ever has been, that there is the painting by Henry Pernay Briggs, which exists, and it's in the Tate Collection. So I can hand it round. So. And you see that the engraving is a very faithful transcription of the, um, 